Our sermon this morning is based on the gospel lesson for the sixth Sunday of Easter from John chapter 14. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. This is the word of the Lord. You need help. Yeah, that's not a question. (laughs) That is a statement, And, and maybe it's not the most polite thing to say, but but it's true. You need help. And I know normally you don't say that to somebody, right? You, you put it in the form of a question like, hey, can I give you some help? Or maybe even soften it even more and say, well, can I lend you a hand? Are you doing okay? Is there anything I can do for you? You just let me know if you need something. And we soften it up because we know what it's like to be the, on the other end, right? When you see somebody struggling and they need help, you know what it's like to be there. And most of us think we can do it on our own, right? Most of us think we're okay. Uh, Either we have enough knowledge, or we have enough strength, or just enough downright determination to do what we got to do. I don't need your help. I got this. I'm okay. And I'm going to die trying. I don't need your help. But I'm here to tell you this morning, not ask you. You need help help. It may not sound polite, but it's the absolute truth. Listen again to the opening words of Jesus in our gospel lesson this morning. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. And at the end, he says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Let me ask you three questions. Do you love Jesus? Secondly, do you have Jesus' commands? Do you you know what they are? And the third question, do you keep those commands? Not not just some of the time, but all of the time. And I probably can safely assume what your answers to those three questions would be. Do you love Jesus? You'd say, of course I love Jesus, right? And I wouldn't doubt that. And the second question, do you know what his commands are? Yeah, of course you know what Jesus' commands are. How about the third question? Do you keep those commands? If you're honest with yourself, I know what the answer is going to be. It's, it's two yeses and now you've got to answer, no, I don't. But yet, what does Jesus say? If you love me, keep my commands. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. Right? So if you love Jesus, you're going to keep his commandments. Right? So how does that work for you? When you say you love him, and you know what those commands are, there's no question there, but you don't keep them. This is a problem, isn't it? I mean, when you, when you think about this, it, it, this is a problem if these words of Jesus are true. This is a problem that, that you can't just put off and worry about later. This, this isn't something that, you know, it'll work itself out somehow. And this is something you got to address, isn't it? This is something you got to deal with. And what are your options? What options do you have to this problem here? Well, I suppose one of them could be you could try harder. You could do better to try to keep those commands to prove that you really do love Jesus. You could, you could learn more about those commands and, and dig deeper to try to keep those commands. Right? Just take, take how Jesus summarizes the law. Right? He summarizes it into two commandments. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. So you could try a lot harder to do those things. To prove your love for Jesus. But how does that work out? 
Just think about that for a little bit. Because the more that you dig into what it means to love God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind, the more that you dig in to what it means to love your neighbor as yourself, you realize all the more what a failure you are, don't you? Right, when you begin to realize that this means that I put God first in absolutely everything, that I put every other person on this planet before myself, and you stare into the mirror of that law, boy, the imperfections you're going to see that maybe you didn't even see before, the more you dwell on that law, on those commands of Jesus, the more of a sinner you realize you really are. When you come to realize that it's not even just the things you do, and it's not even just the things you do and say, but it's even the things that you think and the desires that you have, that you realize this is not the way to go that this option is not going to work for me. That if I'm going to try and prove my love to Jesus, that i got to try all the harder to keep the commandments. Where's that going to leave you? Probably in despair, right? To leave you in despair, that how could I ever do this? And begin to maybe even make you question, maybe I don't really love Jesus. And when I hear Jesus say, if you love me, and you will, then you'll keep my commands, and I realize how much I fail at keeping these commands of loving God and loving neighbor, am I even really a Christian? But there's another option, dear friends. And that option, too, involves despair. But it really is despairing of yourself. To look at that law, to look at those commands and and realize that I cannot keep them. I cannot keep them perfectly as God demands. And it's impossible for me to show love to God, to Jesus perfectly. And to realize what Jesus is really saying here. Jesus is not setting you up for failure. Jesus is not throwing down this challenge for you to accept and to meet. Because when Jesus says, if you love me and you keep my commands, what does he say? He says, I promise you something. He doesn't say, good luck with that. (laughs) Right after he says, if you love me and you keep my commands, he says, I will ask the Father. And he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Jesus talks about love for him and keeping his commandments. And he doesn't say, go, good luck. Instead, he says, I give you a helper. So you see what I mean when I say you need help? Why I say it's not a question, it's a statement, a true statement, because I know I need help, because I love Jesus, and I know his commands, and I want to keep his commands, and I fail miserably, and I know that you're in the same spot. I, I don't doubt that you love Jesus, and that you know his commands, and that you want to keep those commands, but you, I know, fail miser- miserably too. And so you need help, and that's exactly what Jesus promises. He promises a helper. The word that Jesus uses here in the Greek for that, that in, in our lesson here in this, in this version is advocate. The word, if, if you transliterate it from, from Greek to English, it's, it's paraclete. Uh, and this term paraclete is, is one that is, is really important for us to understand. And, and I use the word paraclete because there's really no good English equivalent for this word, 
Right here in our version, it uses the word advocate, but if, but if you look up different versions of English Bibles, you, you might find other translations and other words that are used for that word paraclete. Um, and they're probably all fine and good, but they don't really fully capture what that word paraclete means because there's so much wrapped up in it. It's not simply just defined by, by one English word. It'd be nice if we could just put the word paraclete in our English versions, but then you wouldn't know what that means either. And that's, that's one of the reasons we have sermons, so that we can unravel God's word, so we can, we can extrapolate on it, so we can you know, help us understand it and believe it through the work of the Spirit. That, that term, that name, paraclete, for this helper, has a whole lot wrapped into it. Here, here it is advocate, and, and that definitely is included in it. It's, it's someone who is there to intercede for us and mediate for us and defend us. Uh, this paraclete also includes the fact that he is a counselor, someone who comes alongside of us and, and helps us in, in our time of need, someone who is there to, to encourage us and to guide us. Also wrapped up in that word paraclete is the idea of comforter, Someone who comes and, and encourages and comforts and, and, and is there to be with us when, we, when we're sad and, and, and lonely and, and distressed. So you see that this is a complicated thing. This, this name that Jesus uses for this helper of Paraclete is a complicated one, but also at the same time, an incredibly comforting one. He promises a helper who's also an advocate, and who's also a counselor, and who's also an encourager, who's also a comforter. And notice what Jesus says. He says that I'm going to send you another advocate, another paraclete. Right? And so uh, why does he say another? Who's the other paraclete? Who's the other advocate here? Well, it's, of course, Jesus himself, isn't it? I mean, doesn't Jesus fulfill all of these things? He is our advocate and our counselor and our comforter and our encourager in many ways. Actually, in John's first letter, 1 John in, in chapter 2, he says that Jesus Christ, who is the righteous one, is our paraclete. He is the one who intercedes for us. He's the one who speaks for us to the Father on our behalf. And here Jesus says, I'm going to send you another paraclete. And the reason Jesus promises his disciples another paraclete is, is understood by the context of what's going on. We're here in John chapter 14. And if you remember from last Sunday's sermon, we were also in John chapter 14, right? And we heard about how Jesus says that he, it, there's no reason for our hearts to be troubled. We don't have to be afraid that he's going to prepare a place for us and that the way there is through him, the way, the truth, and the life. These words are spoken in almost the same breath, almost right after that little discourse. He's in the upper room with his disciples. Not long before he'll be arrested and then crucified and he'll rise from the dead and not that long after he will ascend back into heaven. And here he is preparing his disciples and assuring them that though he is physically leaving their presence, he's going to ask the Father to send another advocate, another paraclete, another comforter and counselor and encourager. And then he even goes on to say who that is. He says, I'm going to give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever, the Spirit of Truth. It is the Holy Spirit. It's the third person of the Trinity. Right? The one who is equal to both the Father and the Son in majesty and might and power and glory. This is God, the Holy Spirit himself, that Jesus is promising to send to help you. To be your paraclete. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He sends the paraclete, and through his means of grace, through word and sacrament, he comes and he encourages us. He comes and comforts us. He comes and counsels us. He comes to be our advocate. This one that Jesus promises to us, this spirit of truth, 
who leads us into all truth. This one who comes to help you in your time of need. He comes to comfort you. He comes to remind you of Jesus' love for you. He comes to guide you back to the work of Jesus, which is your assurance. That it's not about how you keep God's commandments that makes you right with him. That this is not a throwdown by Jesus. Keep my commandments if you really love me. But here the Spirit comes and takes us back to the work of Jesus to see all of these commandments kept perfectly by Jesus for us. To see the life of Jesus in the Gospels as he loved God perfectly all of the time for you. Putting God first, loving him with all of his heart and soul and mind perfectly for you. And loving every other human being on this earth perfectly for you. Because you don't and because I don't. To keep every commandment of God for us. The Holy Spirit comes and comforts us with that truth. And then to take us from his life and take us up that hill to the look at that cross. And to see there that righteous one, that holy one, suffering. Suffering the fires of hell. Suffering the agony of the wrath of his heavenly father. Suffering for sin. For every time that you have loved yourself more than God, for every time that you have put yourself before your neighbor, Jesus died. There at that cross, to see the love of Jesus on display for you for every time that you have not kept these commandments. And he takes you to that empty tomb and you say, Look, he's not here, he's alive to assure you that all that work is done for you, to comfort you with the fact that heaven is waiting for you through what Jesus has done for you. The spirit of truth comes. He comes through the gospel. He comes through the word. He comes through the sacrament to comfort you with these truths that brings peace to your heart, that shows you in full display Jesus' love for you. This Holy Spirit, His Spirit of truth, comes to be your comforter and also to be your counselor, to guide you back to that work of Jesus and to see that love, which also then increases your love for Him. Like the more you know that love of Jesus, the more that love of Jesus fills your heart, and the more that love of Jesus is evident in your life, the more it's evident in your words and your actions and even your thoughts and desires. Right? That when we read this through the lens of the gospel, if you love me, keep my commands, we say, yes, of course, Jesus. Of course, I want to keep your commands. Of course, I want to live according to your word. And it's that Holy Spirit, that spirit of truth, that paraclete, who comes to counsel you, who comes to take you back to those commandments and to see that they are not a burden. They are not something you have to do. They are something you get to do. They are not something you have to do to earn God's love. They are something you go and want to do because you already have God's love. They are your way to show your love to the one who has already done all things for you. As Paul says, it's Christ's love that compels us to live for the one who died for us and was raised again. This spirit of truth, this Holy Spirit, this paraclete comes to counsel us into that truth, to love that truth, to desire to live that truth of God's word. And he also comes to be our advocate. This one that Jesus promises to send and comes to us through the word, the spirit of truth is an advocate for us. That when we do sin, when we do fall, when we again put ourselves before God and we put ourselves before others, he leads us back to that cross again. 
he leads us back to that finished work of Jesus once again. When we fail to keep those commands, he defends us. He speaks for us. He intercedes for us. He mediates on our behalf. As again, we're pointed back to that work of Jesus for us, to comfort us, to assure us that, yes, we are loved. Yes, we are forgiven. Yes, we are God's own, that we are one with him. And that's what Jesus describes here, right? He says that I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to come to you through the work of that paraclete. And before long, the world's not going to see me anymore, but you will see me. You'll see me as the paraclete comes and continues to make me known to you. Because I live, you also will live. And on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. That paraclete, that Holy Spirit, comes with that truth over and over and over that you are united with God. Right? He uses this, this picture of the Trinity here, right? You, you see the Spirit mentioned, and the Father's mentioned, and the Son is mentioned, and how they are one. And then he says that you are one with us. You are one with the triune God. What an awesome, amazing truth that the Holy Spirit reveals to us here, that he encourages us with, that he comforts us with, that he again comes to comfort us and give us that peace that only he can give. Friends, this is the one that Jesus promises will help you. The one who comes through word and sacrament that Jesus says that will live with you and who will be in you. That he will be the one who will remind us of what Jesus has done for us and he will remind us of who we are in God's sight. One with him, now and forever. And through faith, we are one with Father, Son, and Spirit. We need this help. We need this help to be continually reminded of these truths. To be continually reminded that it does not depend on us, but on everything that our triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit has already done for us. I need this help. Every day, I need this paraclete to come and to remind me of these truths that, that I know, that, that, that I love Jesus and that Jesus loves me that I know his commands, but I long to know them more, and that I desire to keep these commands, and he is there to pick me up when I fall. And you need this help too. That's not a question. That's a statement, and it's a true statement. I know it's true for you because it's true for me. And Jesus says, I give you all the help you need. I give you this spirit of truth who is with you, and he's in you to continually lead you back to that truth of who you are, loved, forgiven, an heir of heaven, all through the work of Jesus. Amen.